Have you ever heard the saying that life imitates art? The person who coined this phrase was Oscar Wilde, the 19th century poet. Some say he was the first modern celebrity. What Wilde meant was simply that art often shows us the world we want to live in, more than the world we actually have. And sometimes, art can be so compelling and attractive that we change our reality to match. For example, when Brad Pitt wore a slicked back undercut hairstyle in the World War II war drama, Fury, it changed the way a lot of guys thought about their hair. You know this haircut, even if you can't picture it right now, because in the months after that movie, it seemed like half of the men in the country were wearing it. For another example, when the TV show Breaking Bad went big, lots of real world meth dealers started adding blue dyes in their recipes. Because of the show, people thought that this blue coloring meant higher quality meth and a bigger high. Of course, the added dyes only served to make users extremely sick. Just one more example, because I think these are a little fun. A group of real life scientists is currently attempting to recreate the cartoon science of Jurassic Park by taking DNA from dinosaur fossils and combining them with the DNA of a chicken. No, I'm not making this up. So that's the other gene we're looking for. We want to stop that tail from resorbing. So what we're trying to do really is take our chicken, modify it, and make a chickenosaurus. <laughs> it's a cooler looking chicken. I mean, but it's just the very basics. So that really is what we're doing. You get the idea. Art tells us what to value, so we value it. It tells us what to appreciate and what to want. And we change the world to fit the vision that art has given us. I say all this about this idea of life imitating art, because that's one of the ways we got Yellowstone National Park. Long before the general public showed much interest in Yellowstone, artists began painting it, photographing it, and mapping it in a deliberate attempt to make people appreciate how amazing it really is. Long before it was framed by the protective order of Ulysses S. Grant in 1872, Yellowstone was framed in popular paintings and drawings by some of the great American artists of the 19th century. Three men in particular, William Henry Jackson, the photographer, Thomas Moran, the painter, and Henry Wood Elliott, watercolorist and cartographer, led this effort. You might think of them as the guerrilla art kid conservationists of the American frontier. They loved Yellowstone, and when they shared that love through their own creativity, America decided to love it too. They had no real political power, but ultimately, they won. According to the National Park Service website, the wonders of Yellowstone, shown through Jackson's photographs, Moran's paintings, and Elliot's sketches, caught the imagination of Congress. Thanks to their continued reports and the work of explorers and artists who followed, the United States Congress established Yellowstone National Park in 1872. On March 1st of that same year, President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act into law, and the world's first national park was born. As I mentioned last episode, Yosemite was in some ways the first true nationally protected park from the time Abraham Lincoln signed the Yosemite Valley Grant Act. But according to the strict use of the term national park, the first park was Yellowstone. And in many ways, the first official national park is still the national park. Like that of Yosemite and a few others, the name of Yellowstone is virtually synonymous with the national park system itself. When you hear these words, like the words Grand Canyon or Great Smoky Mountains, your mind fills with the images of majestic open spaces and of so much of what is best about our country. From the very beginning, Yellowstone in particular has had an elevated place in the American imagination. Over the years, one president after another has been paraded through this park. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, swinging through the West on a campaign tour, took time out for a visit to Yellowstone National Park. An exponent of conservation, Mr. Roosevelt backed many measures aimed at enlarging our national forests and preserving wildlife. This was a moment of relaxation amid the scenes he loved. 
This is a moment that I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. To return to Yellowstone, where I spent one of the greatest summers of my life. Gerald Ford was an interesting example of a president because he had been a park ranger in Yellowstone. Then after Ford, uh, Jimmy Carter came to Yellowstone and was uh, again fishing, it was, was his primary focus. After Carter, George Herbert Walker Bush, who came to Yellowstone in 1989. Bill Clinton was here twice. Yellowstone is the symbol of our national parks because it's the oldest one and the first one in the history of the world. And then after, after uh, Bill Clinton, of course, we had President Barack Obama. You know, the thing I remember most was, you know, driving by and, and seeing it was elk. And, uh, and I remember bison. And I, in fact, I yeah. ran up close to a bison. <laughs> you might say that the national park system has become something of a mascot for our country as a whole. In some ways, it's impossible to tell the story of our country without it. And it's certainly impossible to tell a story of our national parks without talking about Yellowstone. In fact, you can tell much of the story of the National Park Ranger through this one park alone. In Yellowstone, the NPS transitioned from a volunteer staff to the rangers we know and appreciate today. The first ever ranger, Harry Yunt, was the gamekeeper of Yellowstone in 1880 and is still remembered as the, quote, father of the ranger service. For the first few years, the role of park superintendent wasn't even a paid position. The original superintendent, a rugged Minnesotan, explorer named Nathaniel P. Langford, worked as a volunteer. Not only was Langford never paid, but he also had no budget. So when they established Yellowstone in 1872, the government basically drew a giant rectangle on a map, called it a national park, and then walked away. Just think of the things Landford did not have money for. Campgrounds, outhouses, footpaths, assistance, lumber, breakfast, and so on. And remember, this park is 3,500 square miles in size. That's bigger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. All of that left in the care of one man on a horse. Good luck. As you might guess, Congress eventually used Lanford as a scapegoat, firing him for neglect. They replaced him with another Midwesterner named Philetus W. Norris, who was given a small salary and some marginal funding. According to the NPS, he constructed roads, built a park headquarters at Mammoth Hot Springs, hired the first gamekeeper, and campaigned against hunters and vandals. Through constant exploration, Norris also added immensely to geographical knowledge of the park. Many of Norris's roads are still in use, including the one now known as the Grand Loop Road. As a thank you for all his hard work, Philetus was fired in 1882 and replaced by an incompetent crony of the people in power, including his replacement, superintendents, three through five, all fail to protect the park or significantly advance its development in spite of budget increases and each being given 10 assistant superintendents. As the NPS puts it, in the years after Norris's firing, poachers, squatters, woodcutters, and vandals ravaged Yellowstone. Landmarks were defaced, forests were destroyed, and resources ransacked. And one particularly horrible picture from that era. You can see a row of federal soldiers seated behind the severed heads of buffalo, left behind by poachers who were only interested in their pelts. In 1886, the army had been brought in to combat poachers, lodgers, and vandals. These were rough outdoorsmen and battle-hearted Civil War veterans. As you can imagine, illegal activity within the park took a virtual nosedive. But while these soldiers were great at guarding the park, they were not so great at explaining it to visitors. They could protect the wildlife and fauna, but all they really had to know about trees in order to do their job was that nobody was supposed to cut them down. And this is where the National Park Ranger comes in. The ranger was an outdoorsman, but he was also a capable guide for visitors. 
and an active conservationist. This was not just a job listing at Yellowstone. This was a new brand of public servant altogether. In the words of the first director of the National Park Service, Stephen T. Mather, they are a fine, earnest, intelligent, and public-spirited body of men, these rangers. Though small in number, their influence is large. Many and long are the duties heap upon their shoulders. If a trail is to be blazed, it is send a ranger. If an animal is floundering in the snow, a ranger is sent to pull him out. If a bear is in the hotel, if a fire threatens a forest, if someone is to be saved, it is send a ranger. If a dude wants to know the why, if a sagebrusher is puzzled about a road, it is ask the ranger. Everything the ranger knows, he will tell you, except about himself. Thanks for the chance to join you today. It's always fun and inspiring to me to hear those comments about a ranger's job from a hundred years ago. That's a lot of tradition for today's rangers to live up to, and it's interesting that all those duties from several generations back still apply, along with some uh, duties that certainly could never have been imagined back in the 1920s. I always found answering questions from visitors, just talking to them, and help them have a great trip were the best parts of the job for me when I was working. And certainly face-to-face advice is always ideal, but sometimes that's not possible. And if that's the case and you need some information about a park, just check the official park website. If you go online to www.nps.gov, you can search for the website, any park that you're interested in. Sometimes people can ask some questions that do test either a ranger's ability to give an accurate answer or maybe to keep a straight face. And when those questions came up, I just tried to remember that this was usually the result of someone who was out of their normal element, out of their comfort zone. And so I just did my best to provide a good answer and I could have a good chuckle later on in the day after the contact was finished. Every park has its own set of classic questions that have been asked usually a lot more than once. And Yellowstone certainly is no exception. A couple of examples from there are, do the geysers erupt at night? And does Old Faithful erupt during the wintertime? And the answer to both of those is yes. There are also plenty of misconceptions about wildlife in Yellowstone. After I wrote my first book about humorous situations that can occur in the parks, I received an email from a reader who had a story of his own that he wanted to share with me. He worked for 11 summers in the dining room at the Old Faithful Inn in Yellowstone. And like park rangers, that job gave him plenty of contact with the visiting public. He said one night he had a table of dinner guests who were absolutely convinced that the animals they were seeing in the park, such as the buffalo, as they call them, were not real, but were just animated figures like the ones you see at Disneyland. Such stories go a long way, I guess, toward explaining the sometimes bizarre and even dangerous behavior some people exhibit around wild animals in parks. If there's any consolation to this tale, it's at least uh, that these people would be less likely to try to feed a robotic bear. At the beginning of the show, you mentioned the movie Jurassic Park, which featured a pretty impressive animatronic dinosaur And that's probably uh, one reason between Hollywood and theme parks around the country that people have become accustomed to those artificial wild animals that look very realistic. And therefore, they believe when they're seeing the same thing when they visit the national parks, that's what the situation is. Well, no matter what some visitors may believe about large animals, such as bears and elk and bison, The ones you see in Yellowstone and other national parks are definitely real, they are wild, and they can absolutely be dangerous if you get too close to them. There are some really good reasons why park regulations require us all to stay at least 100 yards from bears and wolves and 25 yards from bison, elk, and other wildlife. Just as a point of reference, for 100 yards, try to visualize the length of a football or a soccer field. And that'll help you stay the right distance away. Unfortunately, of course, everyone doesn't 
follow those rules, and sometimes people end up being injured, unfortunately, sometimes quite seriously. You know, when we think of Yellowstone, probably bears are one of the first things that come to mind, but the most frequent problems in recent years at Yellowstone concerning wildlife and people have been when visitors get way too close to a bison. Uh, we tend to oftentimes to call them buffalo as a result of what we see from Hollywood and in books, but in fact, the correct term is bison. But it doesn't matter what you call them, even though they can weigh up to 2,000 pounds and it may seem rather improbable, they can move very quickly. In fact, bison can run up to 30 miles an hour and they are very unpredictable. So the lesson we can all learn from those folks who did not have a good experience with the bison or any other wild animal, it's just to enjoy them from a safe distance. These are certainly worth coming to the park to see. Yellowstone is the only place in the United States where free-ranging bison are known to have lived continuously throughout recorded history. And there are now over 5,000 of their descendants in the park. That's the largest population on public land in the country. I saw the results of an informal survey not too long ago that asked people what they most wanted to see during a visit to Yellowstone. And the answers were pretty evenly divided between wildlife, thermal features, that's things like geysers, and just scenery in general. Well, there's no question that wildlife viewing and photography are great reasons to visit Yellowstone. And I'm like many of our listeners, I I do a lot of my casual photography these days with the camera on my smartphone. But when it comes to wildlife photos, we just got to be realistic. We talked just a minute ago about keeping a safe distance from wildlife. And you usually can't get close enough safely to take wildlife photos with your phone. That's the way a lot of people get into trouble with bison and other animals there at Yellowstone. You just need a camera with a good telephoto lens if you want to duplicate some of those great photos you see other people posting online. Now, there might be one exception, and that would be if you're caught in a traffic jam due to an animal that's walking right down the middle of the road or alongside of the road. And surprisingly, that situation really isn't unusual, especially with bison in Yellowstone. So if you find yourself stuck in a bison jam, uh, and you get to see some of those animals up close from the safety of your vehicle. Just uh, say that's your lucky day and count it a bonus for your visit. And that's a time when you don't have to have a great camera with a telephoto lens. You can shoot some photos right there from your car with your smartphone. My wife and I have had the chance to sit right in the middle of a what seemed like a river of a bison as they just flowed by on both sides of our car. We've had that experience both in Yellowstone and also in Custer State Park in South Dakota. And it really is an amazing experience. Now, sometimes the animals or birds that you want to watch or photograph are not going to be right in the middle of the road or even right next to them. But one veteran wildlife photographer says you might be surprised that you can actually get some of your best wildlife viewing or photo opportunities right from your vehicle. And the reason is that many animals become accustomed to seeing cars going up and down the road and sitting in parking areas. And so oftentimes animals or birds just ignore vehicles and people in them as long as you stay in the car. However, if you open the door, you get out of the vehicle, there's a good chance you might lose an opportunity to see or photograph that an animal. Just one other tip that I'm sure the park and uh, your fellow visitors would appreciate. If you see a bear or an elk or a bison or whatever alongside the road, if there's a, a safe place to pull over and park and watch it, that's fine. But but please don't just stop right on the road. Block traffic. Other folks may have somewhere they want to go. There's no place to park safely. You may just have to Say, well, we'll miss that one. We'll watch for a, a chance later on in the day. And it's true that spotting wildlife is to some extent a matter of lucky timing, but there are some places at Yellowstone where you can certainly improve your odds. The 
Hayden Valley, H-A-Y-D-E-N. Valley is in the central part of the park. And that's a favorite spot for wildlife photographers. Another favorite spot is the Lamar, L-A-M-A-R Valley. That's in the northeastern part of the park. One tip for the Lamar Valley area, if you're going to the park and you want to specifically visit that area, just check ahead on the park website for some updates. Uh, The road that goes through the Lamar Valley up to the park's northeastern entrance has been closed during this late summer of 2022 due to the major floods. The park has got really a crash program underway to try to get a uh, temporary repairs made and get that road reopened to traffic. They hope mid-October of 2022, which will really be pretty amazing given the extent of damage. But there's an asterisk by their comment about that. They say, depending upon the weather. So just check before you go and make sure the road's reopened. And finally, one other really good tip for wildlife watching. If you have or can borrow some binoculars or better yet, a spotting scope, be sure to take those along to your visit to Yellowstone. They can be a real plus for viewing wildlife while you're in the park. Now, one of the other big attractions for people at Yellowstone, of course, are the the thermal features. And it's really easy to see several of those even during just a single day visit to the park. But it's important to do some homework before you get there and pick and choose a few of the ones you really want to see. And the reason is the park contains amazingly more than 10,000 thermal features. It's the got the world's greatest concentration of geysers. There's also a multitude of hot springs and mud pots and steam vents. So plan where you'd like to go and just don't, uh, just to wait and improvise when you get there. You can make a lot better use of your time. Now, most visitors understandably want to see Old Faithful. That certainly was on our list when our family went there the first time. And to make best use of your time, you can check at the visitor center there close to Old Faithful for the predicted time of the next eruption. You can also find that information online. Park has a recorded phone message that tells you the time of the next expected eruption there at Old Faithful. But just keep in mind that you will not have a cell phone signal or an internet connection in much of the park there at Yellowstone. So checking with the visitor center is your more reliable backup plan. And if you check the park website before you leave home, you'll find some more details about geyser predictions, including that phone number you can call about the, the next expected one. Now, just keep in mind, those are predictions. They're not guarantees. Old Faithful is pretty faithful, but it's not, a, it's not an exact science. Just to help you get an idea I checked in the most recent interval between eruptions in 2022 has been between one and two hours with an average of about 74 minutes. Now, once the eruption starts at Old Faithful, it usually lasts somewhere between about 90 seconds and as long as five minutes. It can vary quite a bit from time to time. So one of the main keys is be sure you're there and in place for a good viewing don't wait till it starts and figure we'll hustle there and, uh, and get a good look as things are underway. And as part of that, just be sure you allow enough time during the busy hours and the peak season to get there, find a parking space, and then walk from your vehicle over to the viewing area. If the parking lots are almost full and there's a lot of parking there, the, the farthest parking spaces are over a third of a mile from the prime viewing area. So give yourself time to get there and not feel rushed. Now, Old Faithful Geyser is completely encircled by a wide wooden boardwalk. And there's a viewing area there that has some bench seating located on the side closest to the parking lots and the inn and the visitor center. And of course, that area is going to be the most crowded. So if you get there and you'd like to have a little more elbow room or you just can't find a place to sit or stand right there, uh, if you'll just visualize coming from the parking lot facing the geyser area, if you walk around to the right on the boardwalk as you face the geyser, that will keep you at a good, close, safe distance to the geyser, be as close there as you would be from the viewing area. If you walk to the left, you'll be getting steadily farther away from the geyser. 
And one other tip for viewing Old Faithful or any place else you're going outside of the park, you'll be a lot more comfortable if you take along a hat and put on some sunscreen and carry some water. If you don't have those things while you're waiting for the geyser, you'll quickly be reminded there's no shade anywhere around Old Faithful. And the elevation is about 7,300 feet. And the sun is just doing its thing. Uh, so what you don't want to take home is a souvenir sunburn. While you're in the Old Faithful area, another thing I would suggest you consider doing is take a few minutes and stroll through the lobby of the Old Faithful Inn. Uh, if you've not already been there, it's worth just taking a quick look inside. The inn is nearly 120 years old. They've got an absolutely amazing, enormous stone fireplace. And the ceiling in the lobby is 65 feet high. It's one of the largest log structures anywhere in the world. And it's a classic example of National Park Hotel architecture. So I think it's worth a peek if you've not been in there before. Here's one more suggestion while you're in the Yellowstone area. And I'll admit it's a bit of a departure from the usual park tips. Restaurants and snack bars there in the Lodge in the inn at Round Old Faithful and elsewhere in the park and, and in the surrounding area around Yellowstone may include a terrific local favorite on their menu, Huckleberry Ice Cream. If you're not familiar with them, Huckleberries are distant relatives of blueberries and they grow wild in the northern Rocky Mountains. Our family first learned about Huckleberries when we lived at Glacier National Park up in northern Montana. Huckleberry ice cream and pie are regional favorites, and there's a good reason that's true, and you're not likely to find them anywhere else in the country. So my suggestion is try not to miss them on a trip while you're in the Yellowstone area. Now, back on the subject of uh, natural park attractions, another very popular spot in Yellowstone is called Grand Prismatic Spring, and it's located about five miles north of Old Faithful in what's called the Midway Geyser Basin. And this spring is is really incredible. It's about 330 feet in diameter. That's longer than a football field. And it's said to be the largest spring in the U.S. and the third largest in the world. And in addition to its size, Grand Prismatic Springs main attraction is the amazing bands of intense colors that completely circle around the outer edges of the spring. And the sequence of the colors is the same as you see in a rainbow, if it's a full width rainbow in the sky, and the same sequence of colors of light that passes through a prism, hence the name Graham Prismatic Spring. Now, just keep in mind, if you want to go there, that lots of other people want to see it too, and parking can certainly be a challenge unless you get there early or late in the day. Before you make that decision, several sources say that in the morning, when the air is cooler, contrast with the very hot water in the spring can cause a dense mist, kind of like a fog or a cloud, to form over the spring itself. And that makes it harder to see the spring in the really bright colors. So if you're willing to wait for a few minutes or maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, I've read, for a parking place to open up in midday during the summertime, some people have posted reviews and they say the colors in the water are most vivid around midday. Other people say if you don't want to fight the crowd, then try to time your visit for late in the afternoon after the tour bus crowd has pretty well left the park for the day. So you have to make your choice, but it's certainly a popular spot and, and there's a good reason why. Now, we talked earlier about the amazing questions people can ask rangers. And I discovered that people have also asked some pretty intriguing questions online about Grand Prismatic Spring. For example, people have asked, can you touch the Grand Prismatic Spring? And can you swim in Grand Prismatic Spring? I realize there are hot springs around the world where you can soak or swim, but the water temperature in those springs is usually not much above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And just for the record, that's not the case at the hot springs in Yellowstone. And Grand Prismatic is not a spring where you want to even touch the water, much less think about 
going for a swim, the average water temperature in Grand Prismatic Spring is about 160, that's 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you even just dip in a finger for a few seconds, uh, that can result in a, a very serious, unfortunately that's happened to a few people who tried that. So please, if you're there and around any of the hot springs in the park, uh, stay on the boardwalk, stay away from the water, and keep any youngsters in your group under close control. And the boardwalks are there for your safety and to protect the uh, the springs themselves. What looks like solid ground around some of those hot springs is really just a thin crust. And if you step off that boardwalk, you might fall right through into a very bad situation. So. Stay on the boardwalk and the trails. They're there for a really good reason. Now, one of my favorite places in Yellowstone has cold, not hot water. And it's the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And the views there of the canyon and the upper and lower falls on the Yellowstone River are just outstanding. Now, you can drive to points very close to both sides of the canyon. And there are some excellent, easy walkways along both rims provide some really great views of the canyon and the waterfalls. Now, there are also some trails that go down into the canyon itself, and they provide some closer views of the falls, but just keep in mind, those are not an easy hike. They're steep, and they've got either lots of stairs or some long switchbacks, and the park makes it a point to warn these are not recommended for visitors with health conditions, and even if you're in pretty good shape, Keep in mind the elevation there is about 7,200 feet. So if you take a strenuous hike there, you may wonder why the oxygen in the air suddenly seems to be a bit scarce. Now, early in the show, we heard about the key role some artists and photographers played in convincing Congress to establish Yellowstone National Park. And one of them was a guy named Thomas Moran, who created a magnificent painting of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone back in 1872. Now, if you go there today, You'll find a modern-day viewpoint with a great view of the canyon and lower falls. It's on the south rim of the canyon, and it's called Artist Point. So we might logically assume that's where Thomas Moran derived his inspiration for his famous painting. However, several reliable sources say that, in fact, Moran's painting was based on the view from the opposite side of what's called Lookout Point. Now, that's just a little bit of interesting trivia for you because you can take your pick. Uh, The view from either overlook is absolutely outstanding. If you want to see the upper and the lower falls both, you're going to have to make more than one stop because the canyon makes a bend between the two waterfalls, so there's no one single location where they can both be seen at the same time. So that just gives you a good reason to Take your time there, stop at several of the overlooks, and they all give you a slightly different perspective of a really magnificent scene. Now, if you can't make it to Yellowstone, but you happen to be in downtown Washington, D.C. someday, stop by the Department of the Interior building. They have a great free museum and includes some wonderful artwork, including Thomas Moran's famous painting of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Now, Mr. Moran concluded it would take a really large piece of art to try to begin to do justice to that scene. And so he delivered on that goal. This this painting, this oil, is 7 feet high and 12 feet wide. So stop in and see it there if you're in downtown D.C. sometime. People who have either worked at Yellowstone or visited there many times have a few tips that I hope will be useful for any of our listeners who may visit the park. And so I'll I'll share those right now. First, this is a really big park. Yellowstone is larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined. So you can spend a lot of your visits just driving from one point in the park to the other. You can make the best use of your time if before you go, look at a map of the park. You can get an old school paper map or look online for some maps and just plan your routes so that you don't spend a lot of time uh, doubling back over the same road. And be sure to check the park website before your trip for some updates on road construction, especially repairs that are still underway again after the big floods in 2022. Second, rather than try to see how many attractions in the park you can cram into just a day or two, just consider picking out several that sound the most interesting to you. 
and enjoy them at a more leisurely pace. Another advantage of that is it takes some pressure off in case Old Faithful is not running on a schedule. Or if you get caught in a bison jam, that way your schedule is not so tight to try to get everywhere in a day that you just have a really a much more pleasant trip. Now, we talked about just a few of the reasons why Yellowstone is so popular with visitors and it's becoming more popular every year. So just try to arrive with realistic expectations that the roads and popular spots like Old Faithful are going to be crowded, especially during mid-June and late August. And one way to help minimize that is to try to go to the most popular destinations as early or as late in the day as you possibly can, because during the middle of the day, it's when it's going to be busiest. Now, if you're going to go early or late, please do keep in mind as you're driving that the importance of watching your speed and being especially alert for wildlife, because those early morning and late evening hours are when the animals are going to be most active. If you are able to get a campsite or a hotel room in the park, then just rejoice. You're some of the lucky ones and take advantage of the chance then you'll have to enjoy a prime nearby location uh, when the park is not so crowded, either early or late in the day. A good example will be Old Faithful Inn or Lodge that are within walking distance of that famous geyser or the Canyon Village area, which is very close to the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And finally, we talked a little about road construction. Be realistic about road construction delays. There just needs to be a lot of work done in the parks on road and bridges and trails and other facilities. And in high elevation locations like Yellowstone, the construction season is very short. And unfortunately, that means it overlaps the prime visitor season as well. But, you know, you just can't pour concrete. You can't lay asphalt in freezing weather. And when there's snow on the road. So just check the park website before you sit out and look for places where road work is underway. Avoid those if you can, and if not, just uh, make the best of delays and figure that's helping make your visit a lot more convenient and safer without having a bunch of potholes to dodge on your next trip. Now, here's one other tip for you. If you find yourself stuck in in a traffic jam, take a good look around at the surrounding area. Several years ago, my wife and I got caught in a lengthy delay for some bridge work. And the section of the road that we were stuck on was right next to the Firehole River. So we started looking around at the scenery, and pretty soon we were grabbing our binoculars. And we were amazed to see what turned out to be a pair of rare trumpeter swans, some of the rarest large birds we have in the United States. And they were just swimming lazily there in the river. They got up and flew off once, and they circled back and landed and swam some more. So we enjoyed them for most of the time we were sitting there in traffic, in the traffic jam for the construction. If the road had been open and we were just zooming along at the speed limit and headed to our next stop, we probably would have missed seeing them altogether. So sometimes an interruption in our also carefully planned schedules for our vacation can provide a bonus if we'll just be alert for unexpected opportunities. Yellowstone really is an amazing place, and I hope many of you listening will have a chance to see it in person at some point during your lifetime. So if you do, just remember, be flexible, be patient if places get busy, try to find some huckleberry ice cream, and if in doubt, try to ask a ranger. As Jim mentioned in our episode on Yosemite, the common wisdom today is that a fed bear is a dead bear. Rangers discourage bear encounters and feeding them human food. But a hundred years ago, feeding bears was one of the main attractions at Yellowstone. Signs reading, Lunch Counter, for bears only, were installed at the park dumps, and visitors would gather to watch them eat garbage. Fortunately, this tradition was banned shortly after World War II. While you probably came into this episode knowing that Yellowstone was famous for geysers like Old Faithful, you may not know that half of the world's hydrothermal features, including hot springs, mud pots, and geysers, are contained in this one park. But don't plan on using the hot springs to relax. They're so acidic that they would not only kill you, but also dissolve your entire body overnight. When the first European explorer in Yellowstone, John Coulter, 
tried to describe these amazing geothermic features to people back east. They thought he was making them up. So before it was known as Yellowstone by the general public, it was called the satirical name Coulter's Hell because nobody thought it was real. On a sunnier note, the rare Yellowstone Sand Verbena Flower is named after this park. Although it only grows on one and a half square acre here, it grows up to three inches tall and there are only four known populations of this species throughout the world. Yellowstone is the only place in the country where buffalo have been living uninterrupted since the prehistoric times. While it was nearly wiped out due to poaching in the early days of the park's history, the buffalo population here has rebounded to 5,000 in recent years. Needless to say, you are much more likely to see one of these on your visit than in Yellowstone Sand, Verbenia. On a quick side note, I was reminded by Jim that one of the most accurate terms for the animal we Americans call buffalo is actually bison. So if you want to get that right, or just sound smarter than the person next to you, now you know. We'll be covering the Grand Canyon National Park in a few episodes, but Yellowstone actually has a similar feature called the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. This canyon is not as famous as its southern cousin, but still measures 1,000 feet deep, 1,500 to 4,000 feet wide, and roughly 20 miles long. Lastly, this park is home to the longest list of mammal species in the lower 48, with 300 species of birds, 16 types of fish, and 67 species of mammals calling it home. Yellowstone is one of those places where you run out of adjectives describing it. It's a magnificent and as vast as it sounds, and I'm sure that if you make it out there, you won't be disappointed. Although, as with Yosemite, not every visitor has been impressed. In his one-star review, Bill E. said, Seen one majestic and colorful thermal feature of archaeobacteria. You've seen them all. They don't even let you touch the geysers. And there's only black and grizzly bears. No panda, polar, or cave bears. Kevin W. added, Yellowstone, more like stupid stone. I don't see any bears. They should have bear shows by daily. You can't swim in any of the hot springs. Plus, I could not check Facebook on my phone. Jim R. went for the jugular. Way too much dirt, you know, like soil. And there was a lot of elk, not too many of the other animals. Those were in good proportion. I also forgot my granola bar and I got hungry, nearly starved. This place is mid as hell. This next review addresses some of the crowding issues the most famous national parks have seen in recent years and offers a more substantial complaint. Chris G., Incredible scenery that is completely ruined by the worst overcrowding I have ever seen in a national park. Other busy parks have gone to a reservation or time slot entry system, and Yellowstone desperately needs it. You might think you can just avoid the touristy spots and you'll be fine. You would be very wrong. The park is enormous, and there are only a handful of two-lane roads connecting everything, so you are guaranteed to be in a massive traffic jam with all the tourists anyway. We are talking about delays in the middle of the woods in Wyoming that put major city rush hour to shame. This is the same complaint we heard for Yosemite, so if that doesn't convince you to book ahead, this should. If you're going to any national park, even one you haven't heard of, do your diligence and your research. Next episode will be in the Redwood National Park with the tallest trees in the world.